Good morning. I'm Bob Kiter. I've had the privilege of uh, directing uh, the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, for the last 24 years. Uh, and I'm just thrilled uh, to welcome everyone uh, to the 24th annual uh, Stegner Center Symposium on Recreation Challenges on the Public Lands. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, first order of business uh, today uh, is for me uh, to recognize uh, those uh, who really uh, make uh, this uh, symposium uh, available at the level uh, that it is, uh, and that's our principal funders, uh, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, uh, which actually is a founding uh, funder for the Stegner Center Symposium from 24 years ago and has consistently been with us uh, since then. Uh, also, the Cultural Vision Fund, <clears throat> which not only provides support for the annual symposium for the Stegner Center, but also supports a number of our other programs, including our Young Scholar Program and our Lecture Series Program. Uh, the symposium is also sponsored by the S.J. and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and our own student-run Natural Resources uh, Law Forum. Uh, let me uh, also extend my thanks to uh, the planning committee for this year's uh, symposium, uh, which consisted of uh, my fellow uh, Stegner Center faculty members, uh, Professor John Ruppel and Professor Danya Rumori, uh, who have been uh, instrumental in uh, designing uh, the program, identifying speakers, uh, and uh, generally uh, moving things forward. Uh, I probably should also say about this year's symposium, for those of you who were with us last year, you know that we addressed the general topic of public lands, uh, and in the course of that, uh, our first speaker made a presentation on recreation challenges on the public lands that was very well received uh, by the audience. Uh, and in response to the evaluation forms uh, that are available for you to uh, complete uh, at the end of the symposium, uh, we got a number of recommendations uh, that this would be an appropriate topic for uh, this year's uh, symposium. And we paid heed, uh, and we're here today now to address uh, this uh, burgeoning issue on our public lands. Um, in addition, uh, other, there are many other people behind the scenes uh, who have uh, uh, really uh, uh, made major contributions to uh, the success of the symposium. Let me uh, first of all thank uh, Jan Nystrom, who's the Associate Director for uh, the Wallace Stegner Center, uh, who really keeps uh, things uh, moving and keeps us on track. Uh, as we go through the planning stage uh, for the symposium. I think Jan's sitting in the back uh, trying to be inconspicuous, but uh, uh, she really is uh, the force behind uh, the Stegner Center and its programs. And if you don't mind, I'd really like to recognize her this morning. Thank you, Jan. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the events team here at the College of Law is absolutely critical to enabling us to carry on at this uh, level. Uh, Chris Monte uh, has overseen uh, all of the logistical preparations along with uh, Spencer Cope and Haley Carmer, our IT staff, uh, Sam Mills and Lance Finch, our communications support team, Janelle 
White and Chad Johnson, along with administrative support from uh, Maggie Spite. Uh, all of those individuals are really critical to uh, making things run uh, smoothly, as they have thus far, and I am confident will continue to. Uh, some quick announcements. Uh, food and beverage, I, well, everyone discovered this already, right? <laughs> food and beverage is available in uh, the lobby. Uh, during the breaks, uh, and you are welcome to bring uh, food uh, into the uh, moot courtroom. Uh, lunch will be served in the multi-purpose rooms uh, down the hallway to the left as you exit uh, out of here. Uh, the King's English Bookshop uh, has a table set up with books available from our authors and others who write about these uh, topics. Uh, please uh, visit uh, the table, uh, buy the books. Uh, the speakers who have books there, I'm sure, would be quite uh, happy to sign uh, books. Uh, we're also joined by several nonprofit uh, organizations uh, whose interests are congruent with the subject this year. They have tables outside. Uh, take the time to visit them uh, and uh, talk to their representatives during the symposium breaks. Uh, if you have to leave uh, during the symposium, uh, proceedings here. Uh, there's an exit uh, back uh, on this side of the room. Uh, please use that in order to minimize uh, disturbance. Uh, lawyers in the crowd, if you need uh, <coughs> continuing legal education, <coughs> sign up at the uh, information table. Uh, for evaluations this year, we're using the online uh, system. Uh, you can fill them out on your laptop or your uh, mobile device uh, or use one of the computers in the lobby uh, during the breaks. Uh, <clears throat> please go to the link that's noted on the comment cards uh, at the uh, registration uh, desk. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> as noted behind me for our question and answer sessions, uh, we'll be using the Slido technology. Uh, the instructions are available here uh, along with uh, handouts uh, that uh, you receive during uh, registration. If you don't have a mobile device and want to uh, pass forward a question, uh, our technology uh, guru, Sam, in the back in the red, uh, can uh, help you with that. Uh, also, <clears throat> we will uh, continue our tradition uh, at the Stegner Center. In the interest of time, we'll only be uh, introducing speakers uh, by name, title, and affiliation. Uh, but uh, complete speaker biographies are available in the brochure, uh, so you can check those. Uh, finally, uh, do what I'm doing. Uh, get your cell phone out uh, and put it on mute uh, so we don't have interruptions. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Robin Craig, uh, the James I. Farr uh, Professor of Law. Uh, here at the uh, University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law, who will handle uh, moderating uh, the first uh, set of speakers. Robin. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Bob mentioned, my name is Robin Craig. I'm a professor here. Uh, and I have to mention, because he won't, a professor here in the top 10 nationally ranked environmental law program for the fifth year running. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> very proud to be part of that. I'm also very privileged to get to introduce our first two speakers. So leading off this conference is Rebecca Watson, who is the former Department of the Interior Assistant Secretary for Lands and Mineral Management and currently a shareholder with Wellburn, Sullivan, Mech, and Thule PC, who will be starting us off with an introduction to recreation on the public lands. Rebecca. Thanks, Robin and Bob. I'm really glad to be back in Utah. On Monday, I was in this same room, but there were three justices or three judges of the Tenth Circuit up here, so I'm glad I'm in a friendlier audience now. <laughs> well, my goal in the next 30 minutes is to provide you with a foundation for the balance of the conference discussion. And as we former assistant secretaries like to do, we keep it at the 40,000 foot level. There'll be other speakers that will dive down into some of the details of these topics, but this will serve to orient you to this topic. Here's some media coverage of Moab's out, 
outdoor recreation-based economy and the threats it poses to federal lands. It sounds on target and timely, but look when that article was written, 1994, 15 years ago. We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, but as far back as their 50th anniversary in 1966, Time Magazine was focused on overcrowding at national parks. So maybe management of outdoor recreational impacts is not a new problem, but a perennial issue that perhaps has reached new levels. As in the past, it poses a challenge to this generation and asks us to consider what we can do to find a solution that sticks. The sheer amount and variety of federal and state and local lands and waters that are available for outdoor recreation in the United States is unique in the world, and it really defines our values as a country. Just in our area of Colorado and Utah, this map illustrates some of the federal lands that we enjoy for outdoor recreation. It illustrates national forest, National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuges, and the BLM conservation lands. Accessing and using federal lands for recreation is important for most Americans, and we all have our own style on how we engaged with federal lands. Over the years, Congress has directed at least seven federal agencies to have an explicit recreation mission, from the U.S. Forest Service in 1891 to the establishment of the National Marine Sanctuaries in 1972, Congress has provided a significant role for recreation on federal lands and waters. The recreational missions of these agencies differ and really depend on their statutory mission. Over the next few minutes, I'll take a closer look at four land managements that we in the West are particularly familiar with, and also take a look at two sources of congressional outdoor recreation funding. The first two land managers, the Forest Service and the BLM, provide for a wide variety of dispersed recreation on lands managed for multiple uses. The latter two agencies I'll speak about, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service, are managed more for conservation purposes and recreational opportunities are more limited. Recreation on the 193 million acres of forest lands is a prime multiple use of those lands and several legal scholars over the last 15 years have identified recreation as the dominant use of forest system lands. U.S. forest reserves as far back as the 1890s have provided for recreational infrastructure that can range from individual cabins built by citizens on forest lands to multi-million dollar ski developments. Forest recreation management is addressed in forest plans, special use permits, and forest regulations, directives, and policies. And you'll see that theme repeated for each of the four agencies. And something to keep in mind is that planning efforts, regulatory efforts, and many permits call for public comment. So you have a role to play in the agency's management of these lands. Outdoor recreation on BLM's 264 million acres is identified in the Federal Land Policy and Management Act as one of the six principal uses of public lands. Outdoor recreation on BLM lands ranges from mountain climbing, hunting, camping, mountain biking, to the annual Burning Man Festival in Nevada, depicted on this screen. So a huge variety. Beginning in the Clinton administration, BLM took action to identify about 27 million acres out of its estate for an explicit conservation mission, and those lands are called the National Landscape Conservation System. Like the Forest Service, BLM recreation is planned in resource management plans and managed through either recreation leases or recreation permits, regulations, and guidance documents. 
Fish and Wildlife Service. Since 1903, when President Theodore Roosevelt set aside the first wildlife refuge in Florida, the refuge system has grown to include 560 refuges on 150 million acres of land and water. <clears throat> the focus of the refuge system is on the conservation of wildlife and their habitats, but Congress has provided for limited compatible wildlife dependent uses, and those are listed on the slide. It's very specific, and that includes managed hunting and fishing to photography. Other recreational uses are not a priority and are only allowed if they don't compromise the primary mission of wildlife and habitat conservation. Fish and Wildlife Services uses refuge management plans to address recre recreational uses on refuges. National Park Service. Although Yellowstone National Park and Yosemite were protected in the late 1800s, the National Park Service was not established until 1916. Today, the National Park Service manages 85 million acres of parks, monuments, and historic sites. There are 58 parks and 397 units. It's important to recognize, though, that out of those 85 million acres, some 57 million acres are in one state alone, Alaska. National Park Service has a dual mission focused on the future. It is to provide for use and enjoyment, but to conserve the park resources unimpaired for future generations. Each park is established by its own legislation with unique provisions but each national park is part of a single national heritage, as the Park Service puts it. Park managers have, have broad discretion on where they make the judgment call on what is appropriate use and enjoyment versus the conservation of resources unimpaired for the future. And there has been plenty of litigation on that topic, but typically the Park Service prevails in its judgment call. Park plans, regulations, policy, and guidance help guide park superintendents' decisions. Now, in addition to these uh, uh, four agencies, there are other authorities that cross-cut across all four, and I'll just talk briefly about those. So the Wilderness Act established the authority to set aside wilderness where man's imprint on the land is not really visible. Recreation on wilderness land is limited to primitive recu uh, recreation and non-motorized. There are 109 million acres of wilderness in 760 wilderness areas. And again, Alaska has the lion's share, 50% of the wilderness acres are in that state. Five states have no wilderness at all, Midwest, East Coast states. The Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is focused on the protection of free-flowing rivers and, of course, protects the land on either side of these free-flowing rivers. Uh, it was initiated uh, back in 1968 with eight rivers. It now protects 12,750 miles on 209 rivers in 40 states. The National Trail System Act <coughs> is designed to establish national trails, both historic, scenic, and recreational, and also supports the Rails to Trails program that takes uh, old railroad rights of way and turns them into trails. Over 50,000 miles of trails have been protected, including 30 national, scenic, and historic trails. Here in Utah, the Old Spanish Trail, the Mormon Pioneer Trail, and the Pony Express Trails are examples of some of those historic trails that tell the story of Utah. There are 1,000 national recreation trails, and in Utah that would include a trail called Fisher's Towers and the Gooseberry Mesa Mountain Bike Trail. Wow. So we have a magnificent system of lands to play on, a huge variety, uh, for people to choose what they want to do where. But how do we acquire these lands and care for them? 
The land management agency budgets are obviously one of the primary sources of the money to manage these lands for recreation. But in addition, Congress has created two broad sources of funding. In 1965, the Land and Water Conservation Fund was established to provide outdoor recreation access for, quote, the health and vitality of Americans. Up to $900 million per year can be appropriated from federal offshore oil and gas lease royalties for two purposes federal land acquisition, and state grants to states with approved comprehensive outdoor recreation plans to help states and local governments acquire and develop recreation facilities. You see here the SCORP for the state of Colorado, where some 97% of its residents recreate on uh, outdoor lands. Um, this was an effort I was involved with in Colorado, and it just was published this year in order to qualify the state to receive LWCF grant monies. Over 50 years, some $40 billion has accrued to the LWCF, but less than half has actually been appropriated. Some $18 billion has been appropriated and spent over those 50 years. One year that I could see was 1998 when Congress actually appropriated more than $900 million. And interestingly enough, that was the year when Congress uh, decided to purchase the New World Mine in Montana to, to protect the watershed of Yellowstone National Park. More typically in the modern era, about half of the $900 million is appropriated, so around $400 million every year. Now, the legislation called to split this money 60% to the states and 40% to the feds. But historically, the feds have taken 61% of the funding and the states only received 25% of the funding. Uh, as many of you know who follow public lands issues, uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund lost its authorization. But just... Uh, um, Two weeks ago, on the 12th of March, after passing the House and Senate with overwhelming votes in a very large bill called the John D. Dingle Jr. Conservation Management and Recreation Act, known colloquially as the Lands Act, uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is back in business and it's been permanently reauthorized. So it's, it's there for perpetuity. A couple changes that were made in the act uh, through the work of Representative Bishop in the House, uh, he helped drive uh, the acceptance of the bill uh, among conservative Republicans, and he got a little bit in exchange, and that was to more explicitly set out uh, almost a 50-50 division between the feds and the states. So 40% of this fund is to go to the feds, 40% to the states, and then 20% and this is another issue that Republicans tend to focus on, perhaps a little bit more than, than uh, their Democratic colleagues, is 20% for maintenance. So acquiring lands is great, but then how do you take care of them? So they've now put in a 20% figure to use for other purposes that can include uh, deferred maintenance projects. And then uh, an explicit 3% or $15 million is to provide for access two lands uh, for outdoor recreation. Some of our federal lands are landlocked, so they set aside some money to purchase those private lands that block access so that uh, folks can access public lands. The next big battle when it comes to LWCF is making the $900 million uh, funding mandatory. And I don't predict that happening anytime soon, but it's going to be in the, in the press. Uh, Senator Manchin from West Virginia, who's the ranking uh, member in the Senate Energy Committee, has said that is one of his priorities. So the second source of funding is the Federal Lands Recreation Enhancement Act, and John Steiger is going to speak in detail about this, so I'll just hit the high points on this. Uh, and this authority was to allow the four land management agencies that I've been talking about this morning to charge entrance fees or fees for amenities like boat docks or uh, nice toilet facilities, campsites, something above and beyond your standard run-of-the-mill forest service BLM site. 
And this was an effort I was involved in when I was in the Bush administration. We pushed really hard for that through 2000 and were finally successful in 2004. But it was then and remains now very controversial. And, and why is that? And that is that many member, um, users of the public lands don't think that they should have to pay for their lands. Their taxes should cover it. So there has been... So as a result, as you'll hear from John Steiger, Congress has taken a cramped interpretation of this authority. The Park Service may be able to collect parking fees, but not the BLM or the Fish and Wildlife Service. So some amenities on one land manager's land you can charge for. If they're on another uh, land manager's land, no, you can't. There's been a lot of litigation. I just cite here two more recent cases. Okay, what really is a fancy toilet? Well, a porter potty is not. So that, that was rejected. You can't charge an amenity fee for that. So uh, there's no end of challenge to this uh, authority. So it's really been underutilized. So a little bit on what is driving uh, demand on public lands. Over the last two to three years, the New York Times, The Guardian, The Denver Post, The Salt Lake Tribune have all highlighted crowding and outdoor recreational impacts on public lands. What's driving that use? All states now have a robust focus on tourism as part of their state economy, and federal lands play a key role in drawing tourists to their states. I chose here four examples that show how each of the four agencies we've been talking about are a focus of the tourism advertising in these states. Federal lands are often the backbone of the tourist industry in a state, and I would argue that's the case here in Utah and Colorado as well. Outdoor recreation has also become a big business and as a result of a congressional directive to the Bureau of Economic Analysis to really calculate what that economic impact was, there is a new interest in Congress and in state houses to attracting the outdoor recreation business to states. The outdoor recreation business depends on federal lands and federal outdoor recreation infrastructure to contribute that significant 2.2% of U.S. GDP. It is an industry that is also growing at a faster rate than the rest of the economy, as shown on that upper graph. What recreational activities contribute the most to these numbers? Boating and fishing are the largest core activities, as shown on the lower graph, and ATV and motorcycling activities are the fastest growing activities, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And I know Ray Rasker will be diving into these details more. Another phenomenon that uh, supports this outdoor industry business is that states have now established outdoor industry outdoor recreation industry offices. And Utah was actually the first state to establish such an office. There are now eight states, uh, primarily in the West, but North Carolina is one of the East Coast. They wanted to be the first state on the East Coast to establish such an office. There are also uh, commissions and task force in four other states. And then there is activity right now in this legislative session in New Mexico, Maine, and Nevada to create outdoor recreation offices in those states. In 2018, the eight outdoor recreation offices signed the Confluence Accords to have shared principles for this industry. And they talked about stewardship, workforce training, economic development, and health and wellness as being four core principles. Interestingly, in July 2018, Utah State University Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism took a really close look at these offices and noted that there was uh, distinct differences between these offices. Some were really more focused on the economic development side, whereas others were more focused on traditional wildlife and conservation side of, of uh, state governance. So that's a very interesting study that I commend to you from Utah. These 
Economic drivers are increasing recreational demand on federal lands, and that is having impacts on wildlife, their habitat, on trails, on water quality, and infrastructure. <clears throat> and I think we'd all agree that crowding in and of itself really diminishes the experience that we go looking for when we go outside to recreate. We want to be close to nature, not necessarily close to our neighbors. Earlier this month, writer Todd Wilkinson asked the question, can greater Yellowstone's wildlife survive industrial strength recreation? And he challenged the outdoor industry, which meets annually in Jackson at the SHIFT conference, to pay more attention to how recreation is impacting the wildlife in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. <clears throat> There's also demographic change that we have to be aware of. The world's populations have grown, have become more affluent, and there's more leisure time. Forty years ago, a Chinese tourist was highly unusual. In 2016, over three million Chinese visited the United States, and there are many more that are anticipated to be coming. The Outdoor Foundation collected data showing that 49% or some 146.1 million Americans recreate at least once a week, and 20% of us recreate twice a week in the outdoors. The two largest generations are contributing to outdoor recreation demand in different ways. Baby boomers are retiring and hitting the road to travel, while millennial generation is looking to spend their money on experiences that include outdoor recreation. Another important demographic issue is more about those that may be left behind, that aren't coming out to recreate. And this is something that land managers and the federal agencies and the outdoor industry are struggling with, and that is the overwhelming white nature of outdoor recreationists in all age groups. The U.S. is becoming increasingly diverse. We all read that and see it. Yet the outdoor recreation crowd is not keeping up with this demographic change, and this is a problem that uh, agencies, both at federal, state, and local levels, are focused on. All of these economic and demographic forces are driving visitation and outdoor recreation on federal lands to record levels. Just a week or so ago, the National Park Service issued its statistics for 2018, and those numbers show that four out of the mighty five parks here in Utah broke attendance records. Zion National Park was the fourth busiest park in the United States in 2018. But other public lands other than national parks are also experiencing high vis visitation. The White River National Forest in Colorado is the most visited national forest in the U.S. and recreational use on U.S. Army Corps of Engineer impoundments exceeds that of the U.S. Forest Service at some 300 million visitors a year. In addition to growing demand, there are some new uses that challenge land managers. The growing use of social media to post geotagged photos can draw huge numbers to once isolated spots. Horseshoe Bend, depicted on this slide, is one such place. It was kind of a sleepy, really cool geological place where you've got about 4,000 visitors. And then Instagram was launched in 2010. Visitation grew to 100,000. Five years later, it was 750,000. And this year, in 2019, they are anticipating 2 million visitors. I can tell you from working in the federal government that federal land management budgets don't move that fast. They don't move at the speed of digitation. So uh, they're planned three years out, and they cannot react as quickly to, to respond to these uh, uh, phenomena of popularity. The conflicts and challenges of motorized recreation and travel planning have been around for decades. Utah is well familiar with those debates. But we have some new recreational technologies out there that are raising new questions. Fat tire snow biking, mountain biking, mountain bikes that can go further into the backcountry than ever anticipated, they're bringing new management challenges. What about mountain bikes in wilderness? 
Some advocate that the Forest Service should open wilderness trails to mountain bikes. On the other hand, what about taking forest lands that have been used for mountain biking and putting them into wilderness? That's a debate that's going on in Colorado right now. And then, what about e-bikes? Are they motorized? Are they non-motorized? Or are they non-motorized if they only go so fast? These are issues that uh, our agency in Jefferson County Open Space had to deal with. And we did put a limitation on the size of the motor of an e-bike that can go on trails used by multiple users. So these are some of the new challenges that are out there. How are federal agencies equipped to handle high recreational demand? I think these are very challenging times for land managers. Budgets have been flat or declining for over 20 years. They are an easy place to cut. Trump's 2019 budget proposes that the U.S. Forest Service budget for recreation and deferred maintenance be cut by 50%. Experienced land managers are retiring by great numbers, and their positions are not always being filled. I attended a meeting this February in Washington, D.C., of federal recreational managers of these seven agencies I mentioned to discuss recreational management challenges, and their message was, we lack the capacity to handle outdoor recreation stewardship. They just don't have the bandwidth to address this growing demand. Last week, the Senate Energy had a hearing on outdoor recreation, and Alaska's Senator Lisa Murkowski, who's the chair of that committee, shared a story that illustrates the capacity issue. She said there was an outfitter in Alaska who wanted to start an ice fishing business on the Chugach Forest. He approached the Forest Service for a permit and was told there was a permit moratorium and that he should come back in seven years. Some who use the public lands behave poorly without consideration for others or for the shared landscape they're on. Land management staffing is not at a level to police these types of uses. These photos illustrate some extreme behaviors on public lands. A conga line up to half dome we see the same phenomena on uh, trails to 14ers on the weekends in Colorado. Vandals in an Oregon forest who not only graffiti the outhouse, but then for some inexplicable reason stole the toilet. Transients uh, camp in, in uh, Forest Service campgrounds adjacent to Boulder. Uh, they leave their trash and their needles behind for the Forest Service to manage and local users are afraid to use these lands. The last is a photo from Joshua Tree National Park uh, during the government shutdown when some users in the unmanaged national park cut down Joshua trees in order to access a part of the park they wanted to get to. We've heard a lot about deferred management and each land management agency faces that challenge. And that's basically maintaining the roads and the facilities that visitors and federal employees depend on at those sites. Again, at the Senate hearing last week, Senator Murkowski told her colleagues that the maintenance backlog on our public lands is significant and it now totals $21.5 billion across Interior and Forest Service. You might think, well, wait a second, we've got that land and water conservation, a couple, you know, $20 billion rolling around. But remember, maintaining wear and tear, that's not a one-time expense. It reoccurs year after year. So you need a source of funding that can address those needs through the future. How can land managers address these challenges? Maybe taking a look at improving outdoor recreation regulation and planning. Outdoor regulation, when it's contrasted to oil and gas or timber or grazing, is largely unregulated. How about controlling demand through entry fees and reservations? These are all tools that managers are looking at and including here in Utah. But that can come with a cost to gateway communities. A recent National Park Service study 
said Moab could take a $22 million hit in the first year of a reservation system, but it then would come back. But that's a lot to plan around, $22 million in one year for a community the size of Moab. You can disperse recreation to other sites, but you have to ask yourself, well, where? If all these other federal lands are also being hit by increased demand, where can you push recre recreation, and how can these land managers work together to perhaps disperse users? Another idea is to harden infrastructure. So there's certain places that are getting a lot of use, Horseshoe Bend. They had to put a, put a fence in up around the edge because people were taking, uh, taking a lot of risks uh, to get that Instagram-worthy photo. Uh, so you can harden the infrastructure to take the demand, but that can be hard. One of our 14ers, uh, which gets heavy use because it's the closest one to, to Denver, uh, has a lot of impact on the trails. There are no toilets. People are going in the woods, trashing up the place. Uh, but the, so wh why not harden that trail and put in toilet facilities? Big problem is that it's in wilderness. So that's a challenge. Can we find new sources of revenue to help maintain our federal recreational areas? Uh, users pay to play. Hunters, fishermen, uh, off-highway vehicle users, snowmobilers, both on a nationwide basis and then these latter users on a state-by-state -state basis, have taxed themselves to put money back into conservation and trail maintenance. But the quiet outdoor recreation industry resists these kinds of taxes on their equipment, which can range from $50 backpacks to $12,000 mountain bikes. States are being creative about generating revenue for outdoor recreation land care, and Ray Ratzker will again highlight some of those efforts. In Colorado, Vail and Eagle County are providing the U.S. Forest Service with $120,000 to monitor the trails and campgrounds on the White River National Forest that their recreational economy depends on. Think about that. Paying the Forest Service to maintain their trails and campgrounds. That kind of gives you a good idea of how tough things are at these land management agencies. Well, what about federal legislation to address 21st century recreation challenges? In 2017, Congress passed the National Trail Stewardship Act to focus the Forest Service on increasing volunteer stewardship on federal lands. That's run up against the capacity issue to work with volunteers. In 2019, the lands bill that reauthorized the LWCF, Congress also set aside 100 pieces of land for conservation recreational purposes and provided new direction for access for hunters and fishers. On the funding side, Congress is again considering our Restore Our Parks and Public Lands Act that would take other oil and gas revenue to focus largely on the NPS deferred maintenance backlog. We've talked about full appreciation appropriation of land and water conservation fund, but both those, this proposed act and LWCF, depend on one source, oil and gas. And we've got things like the Green New Deal, other climate change efforts that want to stop federal oil and gas leasing in the near future, or at least greatly diminish it. So what happens then? So there are plenty of challenges and Proposed solutions can look hard to achieve, but in my research, I was really inspired by what our four fathers and mothers did in 1958. This was the post-World War II generation coming out to enjoy public lands, and there was a huge demand at that time. Congress created an Outdoor Recreation Resources Review Commission, and it consisted of eight elected officials and seven private citizens, and was chaired by Lawrence Rockefeller. They gave themselves a two-year time horizon to complete their work. They collected a heck of a lot of data, and they focused not just on the short term, but the long term. Here they were in 1958 and said, we're going to look out to 1976 and the year 2000. How can we plan for outdoor recreation into the future? And then they worked closely with state and local governments. The results were pretty darn impressive. The Bureau of Outdoor Recreation, the National Outdoor Recreation Act, LWCF, 
And they helped create part of the momentum that led to the Wilderness Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, and the National Trails Act. Congress is once again paying attention to outdoor recreation. Senator Murkowski put it this way, I want to start identifying fixes that can be implemented, whether it's through administrative action or legislation, to ensure federal lands are open for those incredible recreation experiences and continue to be a source of economic prosperity. So I'll leave you with this question. Can this generation meet our outdoor recreation challenge with bold action and a fix that sticks? So thank you. We have a couple of questions already. Uh, what advice would you give to the students who are here today and who will be the next generation of public land managers? Hmm. Well, I would say do consider a career in public service. Uh, no one talked that much about it when I was in law school, but I have to say my two times in, well, three times in federal government were very rewarding and they fill you with a lot of meaning. Uh, we need new blood and new generations in these federal land management agencies. They don't make it easy, but if you persist, get some connections. I'm sure Bob can help with that. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can get in the federal government, I th and I think that's important. But there's other ways that you can participate outside as well. Okay, uh, the next question we've gotten is, how should we balance the goal of increasing public land visitation with our desire to protect sensitive lands and avoid overcrowding? Well, I think that's where land use planning comes in and really taking a thoughtful look at where you strike that balance. Um, some lands can take greater activity and maybe we should provide for that and create a magnet to draw people there because we can manage it better whereas other places we need to protect. Again, Jefferson County Open Space, uh, this is an amazing open space organization just outside Denver, and we have made choices to prohibit recreational climbing in Clear Creek Canyon on 6th Avenue in certain places to protect raptors. We've also set aside areas to protect sensitive resources. And of course, the federal agencies do that as well. And that, you know, that calls for, for judgment and for engaging in these public planning processes, but those are expensive, time-consuming processes, so uh, they perhaps don't happen as frequently as they should. Okay. Uh, has there been a noticeable conflict between oil and gas extraction and recreation on any of the federal public lands? I think that those kind of conflicts come up, but you don't, you don't read about that uh, so much now. I mean, I think there's organizations like here in Utah, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, that work to protect lands for wilderness, recreation, that may be proposed for leasing in oil and gas, so certainly you see that conflict there. Um, but once a land has been opened up for oil and gas leasing, uh, then not so much. But the, the recreational resource is always considered at the leasing stage and at the development stage, and yes, there are conflicts there. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the continuous workforce restraints on the Park Service during this time of growth and recreation uh, and the worries from those within the agency uh, that the workforce restraints are uh, an effort to undermine the agency and maybe privatize our national parks? Hmm. Well, having served in the government, I'm not a huge fan of conspiracy theories. Um, <laughs> My experience is that the federal government couldn't conspire its way out of a brown paper bag. But uh, <laughs> I would say that um, I think what's happening, it's not just this administration that has slighted the budgets. It has been 20 years. It's been several administrations. There are bigger demands on our budget, entitlement spending, defense spending. They take up the lion's share. So discretionary spending is quite small. And these public land management agencies, the western part of the U.S., can get shortchanged. I think it's uh, 
It's a very significant issue, and I think that's one thing where we all can play a role. Here we have Congress right now at the Senate Energy Committee talking about outdoor recreation and what we need. We need to advocate that these agencies need to be funded to address outdoor recreation. Here it is, a significant part of our economy, as much as the oil and gas and mining industry, as much as the healthcare industry. Well, who's advocating for the outdoor industry and the federal uh, managers for a budget adequate so we can enjoy these lands. So I think that's something we all can do. Okay. Uh, you've mentioned our, our unique public lands here in the United States and some of the challenges they're facing. Are there other places in the world, other uh, countries who have similar kinds of public recreation issues that we might be able to learn something from? Mm. I can't you're aware. Say, yeah, I have looked into that too much. I've had my own recreational experiences around the world, and I could say in South Africa, they're looking to attract people to come, to hunt, to help uh, preserve their wildlife and provide an economic development. Scotland is very different because it's a private ownership of wildlife. So the, our systems here to manage wildlife and, public, and the fact that we have federal lands managed by the federal government is fairly unique. Uh, but I can't say that I've, I've looked into the issue. Okay. Um, what do you believe is the greatest challenge to uh, overcoming some of the destructive behaviors that you mentioned? Yeah, I, you know, I, I find it really troubling, and I don't know if it's a phenomenon of this particular time and these particular people. Have we failed somehow in teaching land stewardship, good wood sense, or is it um, something that's always been there? I think it's something worth taking a look at, but uh, I belong to some stewardship organizations, and the reason we went back to Washington in February was to have that discussion. How do we publicly educate and manage these impacts? Because they are terribly destructive, and it seems like people People don't even care about each other, and uh, I, I uh, often see when I'm walking on open space in Colorado, little plastic bags of doggy poop left beside the trail. Well, you're meant to take it out yourself, not <laughs> wait for someone else to pick it up. So I don't know what you do with that, where, where we point the finger as to why people are not considerate, but I think it happens more uh, than just on the outdoors as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the issues that are arising when people can geotag their Instagram photos and tell the world exactly where to go to see these places. Is there any response to that in the federal public agencies? And if so, how are they responding to this social media um, advertising of what were once fairly limitedly visited places? Yeah, I don't know that the federal agency is, is really developed a response on that. I, one of the pictures that was on that slide was from Jackson, and Jackson has started a public education media campaign. It said, you know, what's a patch of wildflowers worth, uh, an Instagram photo. And so there are some efforts that are highlighting that. that. That was an article from the New York Times talking about the impact of geotagging. So I think there's some awareness to it. Uh, but I'll tell you, I was going online to look at the super bloom in California, and I was looking at this particular canyon with all these poppies, and then two days later, they had to close it because there were so many people coming, trampling the wildflowers that they were de destroying the, the beauty. And so it's, it's shut. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. So welcome to the digital age, right? Yes. All right, uh, last question that we have time for is a follow-up on your wanting us to all become funding advocates. Uh, who are our champions in Congress, and how can an average citizen urge that kind of action by Congress? Well, I think um, everybody talks a good game about outdoor recreation. It seems to be a bipartisan support, as evidenced by the lands bill, it might be an outlier here in the state of Utah that will remain nameless, but uh, in any event, most people support it, but some are stronger advocates. I, you know, I would say that uh, on the Republican side, Cory Booker in Colorado, he helped 
promote the legislation that led to the Bureau of Economic Analysis study. Lisa Murkowski, obviously, from Alaska, and she's very powerful, uh, is, is supportive of it. I think Rob Bishop even uh, was supportive of the lands bill and understands the role of outdoor recreation in the state of Utah. Of course, he's leaving office soon. But I think you need to talk uh, to all the representatives. I mean, you're in Utah, and you have your Utah representatives. You need to educate them on how you think it's important. And I think approach it perhaps in a different way. They may hear all the time about, well, we've got to save these lands. We need more wilderness. Well, maybe talk about how are we going to take care of the lands that we already have. That resonates with Republicans. How are we going to take care of what we have? So talk maybe about different things and talk about how outdoor recreation supports the economy of my town or my community. Uh, so I think look at your audience and decide uh, how to frame your message, what points that you care about to hit with each individual person. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Welcome. you for all of your questions. Yes, I believe Rebecca will be around. Yes. All right, so thank you, Rebecca, for that wonderful introduction to the legal, the social, and the economic issues uh, facing our public lands and recreation. Uh, economic issues are something we will likely be hearing about for the rest of the entire conference, but to give us a broader based inf uh, introduction to recreation economics. We are very lucky to have Ray Rasker here with us today. He's the executive director of Headwaters Economics and uh, will be giving us that overview on what outdoor recreation is worth. So thank you, Ray. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I was here last year, and it was a great event, and uh, thanks, Bob, for putting this together. It's always really well run, and uh, I'm always very impressed by the, uh, the, the quality of the discourse. Um, so I'm with Headwaters Economics, and I'm going to give you first a, a broad overview of the economic impact of outdoor recreation. <clears throat> and then I'm going to zero in on some communities and, and hopefully with some solutions. So outdoor recreation in general, um, <clears throat> there have been two big studies, Rebecca alluded to one of them. Um, the first one is the Outdoor Industry Association. They sort of led the charge here. <clears throat> Excuse me. They, um, they hired um, Southwick Associates out of Florida. Uh, they've been working for a long time with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're sort of experts on, on this. Uh, what they did is they looked at all the different types of, of ways that people can recreate outdoors, and um, they conducted a household survey. So it's a random sample national survey. Their data is available at the state level as well. Um, and what they found out, that in a nutshell, uh, there's 7.6 million jobs associated with uh, the production and distribution of goods related to outdoor recreation or production and distribution of services related to outdoor recreation. And um, along with those jobs, of course, come some other pretty big statistics, about $887 billion in consumer spending, uh, quite a bit of money in federal and state taxes. So Outdoor Industry Association has for quite some time now been saying, this is a massive industry. You need to be paying attention to us. We want a seat at the table. Um, then the next effort was, as Rebecca described, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And, um, so what we were doing there is a, a different approach. I, I was one of the consultants who got hired to help out with this process, but most of the work was done by the uh, highly qualified staff at BEA. Uh, we were looking at the contribution of the outdoor industry in terms of its contribution to great, uh, gross domestic product. So you can imagine one of the first things I got was a spreadsheet that was 5,000 columns by 5,000 rows of every single good and service produced in the U.S. economy and its value, right? So we're tracking 
the, the value-added contribution of outdoor recreation all the way through the, the, the production line. So a piece of steel becomes a bicycle wheel and everything in between, including wholesale and retail. And so, we, and so on every single one of these cells in the spreadsheet, you have to identify, is this part of outdoor recreation or is it not part of outdoor recreation or is it partially part of outdoor recreation? So take a day pack, right? College students wear day packs. When we go hiking, we wear day packs. Is a day pack related to outdoor recreation? Partially. Is it 0.4? Is it 0.8? Um, if you can assign a number to that, then you need metadata. You need to actually document that there was a study by the Outdoor Industry Association or somebody like that that said backpacks are used 40% of the time for outdoor recreation. Then you put 0.4 there. And you do that thousands of times. Um, we did part of that. The staff at BEA did the bulk of the work. It, was, it, it took two years. It was a very expensive project. Um, we define recreation as activities undertaken for pleasure that generally involve some level of intentional physical exertion and occur in nature-based environments outdoors. So in other words, not going to uh, a football game and sitting in the bleachers. That's not outdoor recreation. Um, and then we looked at core activities, so the production and purchase of gear, but also supporting activities such as travel and tourism expenses, and in addition, government expenditures related to outdoor activities. And I'll get to that figure in just a minute. So what we found out, it's 2.2% of GDP. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, um, but it's, 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 it's about the same, it's bigger than mining, it's bigger than broadcasting, it's bigger than the pharmaceutical industry. So the pharmaceutical industry, however, has 1,500 lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The outdoor industry has three. So there's, there's a big difference right there. Um, 4.55 uh, million uh, jobs, so a little bit smaller es estimate. I can, maybe through question and answer later on, I can tell you why that's a bit smaller. <clears throat> but in either way, a massive industry that's covering our entire country. So um, I want to make a, an important point here, and that is when we, when we talk about outdoor industry and outdoor recreation, we tend to think in terms of people buying stuff either in stores or at gear shops or online, and that's our economic impact, right? It's tourists and those of us who play outdoors buying stuff. That's part of the story. The other part of the story is communities that have really good outdoor recreation facilities are also wonderful places to live. They attract talent, they attract entrepreneurs, and those entrepreneurs in turn will use the outdoors as a way to attract talent. And then finally, you have quality of life and, uh, and health. Um, it makes us as individuals happy and healthier to play outdoors. Um, let me give you an example of the talent. Um, so here's Goldman Sachs. This is their online recruitment portion of their, uh, their website, the Salt Lake City office. And they say, Salt Lake offers great outdoor recreation with 15 national parks and monuments all within a one day drive. So companies like Goldman Sachs are saying, the outdoors is a way for us to attract and retain talent. Um, closer to home, I live in Bozeman. Uh, this is Allie Knapp. She's the CEO of a, a software company. Um, and she says access to Montana outdoors is a competitive advantage to attract top talent. We have an organization in Montana called uh, Business for Montana's Outdoors. And it's all CEOs of corporations saying the outdoors and the, the uh, public lands of Montana are an economic asset for us. This is how we compete with Boston and San Francisco for talent. Come work for us and you can go fly fishing after work. Um, and then finally, we have a, a tsunami of retiring baby boomers. Um, this is uh, Peter Koleski and Kanab. And he says, the National Monument provides activities normally associated with the university towns that are now available to all of us in this remote area. This is um, an important statistic. Retirement investment income is 44% of the total uh, personal income in Kane County and is 50% of the net growth since 2000. So l people like Peter are the single largest driving force of the economy there right now. 
So what is it about the scenery, the surrounding public lands, the surrounding landscape? Um, I found this in the New York Times in the last edition. I'll let you absorb that. Um, so the Economic Research Service of the USDA has a classification system. They classify all the counties in the U.S. according to whether they're, where the, what they're dependent on economically. And they have a classification called recreation counties. And these are counties that have a certain level of economic dependence on recreation. And so what we did is we looked at migration into recreation counties. And all counties in the U.S. can be split into metro, micro, and rural. And you can see that average net migration is higher in metropolitan areas where there's recreation counties. And you can see that micro and rural counties have been losing population unless they're recreation counties. So the recreation counties are attracting people. And the people who move into those recreation counties are of higher incomes. Across the board, metro, micro, and rural, on average, people who move into these recreation counties I have a higher income than non-recreation counties. Um, so let's shift to public lands. Um, <clears throat> here's the visitation to BLM land uh, from 2010 to 2018. It's about 15% increase. It's 8.5 million more visits. Um, that's a national figure. Uh, Forest Service, now this is an interesting one. The Forest Service um, has their data by groups, and what they have is a system called ENVUM. They do a random sample survey of visitors. So one year they survey one forest, and another survey a year they survey another forest, and, and on average they have sort of an estimate over all the forests in the nation. So 2007 to 2011, they have one estimate. 2012 to 2016, they have another estimate. They said there's been about a 2% increase. I think what this underscores, I just don't believe it. I think it's much higher than that. I think it underscores the difficulty of measuring recreation use on public lands. It's really tough. Um, it's not a, it's not, I'm not trying to pick on the Forest Service managers. I just think it's really difficult to measure dispersed recreation. Um, and then finally, the Park Service, where we do have good recreation numbers, um, from 2010 to 2017, 18% increase, 50 million more visits. Um, and then each one of these visits, when people come and they spend money at a BLM, Forest Service, National Park land, they spend money and that in turn creates jobs. So we have 65 million visits to BLM land, creating about 48,000 jobs. Same sort of impact. Forest Service, uh, 148,000 jobs though. Um, and then 31, 331 million visits to uh, National Park Service, about 318. So altogether, um, over half a million jobs are associated with people visiting BLM, Forest Service, and, uh, and National Park Service lands. <clears throat> so um, how does that compare to the funding for these agencies? The recreation budget for the BLM has dropped by 18%. It's a loss of about $14 million. It's about 4% of their budget is devoted to recreation. Uh, Forest Service, um, a drop in 16% in their budget, uh, about $49 million less than they used to have. That's a, and and currently it's 4% of their budget as well. Um, and then part of what we've seen within the Forest Service is of course fire borrowing. When there's a big fire um, and it's very expensive, the agency needs to borrow, and I put this in quotes, they borrow money from other departments, but they, they never pay it back. They basically raid other departments to pay for wildland firefighting. So um, from 2000 to 2015, while the wildland fire staff within the Forest Service grew by 114%, their budget related to recreation, heritage, and wilderness dropped by 28%. Wildlife and fish management dropped by 18%. So this is the opportunity cost of wildfires when you have to raid um, other budgets. Um, finally, we've got the Park Service. Um, their budget went up um, about 12%, uh, an, an additional $38 million. And um, you know, as you all know, and Rebecca talked about this, the the, the park has been promoting um, 
visitation to the parks leading up to the centennial in 2016. Starting in 2013, there were all these efforts, you know, find your park. Uh, I've got friends who live in Yellowstone. I, I live in Bozeman, about an hour from Yellowstone. I've got friends who live there and they were, they were going, please don't find our park. We already, <laughs> you know. So in the decade that I've lived in, in Bozeman, we had three million visitors. Is what we always knew was the annual visitation in Yellowstone. Now it's gone up over four million visitors. So, um, <clears throat> so what happens when you promote the parks? Um, so here's Utah's Mighty Five. Um, and you can see uh, from 2013 to 17 for the five parks, it's a 66% increase. That's 4.2 million additional visits. So just imagine the pressure on the communities. Um, and then when you look at all park units, not just parks, but all sorts of units, including monuments, um, since 2013, I'm picking 2013 because that's sort of the beginning of the promotional effort, 57 more visits, 21% increase, or in park units alone, if we just look at national parks, 20 million more visits, a 30% increase since 2013. So if you advertise your parks heavily, people pay attention to it and they come. Um, so this is uh, my two parks in Montana where I live, uh, Yellowstone and, and Glacier. Um, each now have close to a million visits. Um, Glacier's increased by 41%, Yellowstone by 30%. So you go to Yellowstone, and you're expecting to see this, and instead you see this. Um, it's just crowded. Um, it, you know, on the one hand, it's a good sign. Uh, Americans and foreign visitors, they love what America has to offer. They love nature. They love going outdoors. Um, it's a good thing that people are connecting to the outdoors. Um, but it's a management question. Uh, you know, how do you manage this many visitors and still have it be an enjoyable experience? And then, of course, you have the maintenance backlog issue. Uh, the numbers Rebecca shared with you are a little bit more recent than what I have here. Um, anyway, it's a continuing issue. So um, let's talk about other sources of funding besides relying on the federal government. Um, one of the questions that we got asked um, when we were putting these numbers together with BEA, or when BEA was putting together the numbers, um, is how much does government spend on outdoor recreation? And the federal agencies spend about $4 billion, but $30 billion of it comes from state and local. So let's explore that a little bit. Uh, we did a study for the Outdoor uh, Industry Association where we looked at sources of state funding. And I'll just walk through a few examples. In Colorado, when you buy a lottery ticket, you know you're contributing to the outdoors. Um, in California, they've got $10 billion in voter approved bonds. Um, there's a bed tax in Utah, which helps pay for some, some grants. Um, in Washington, the legislature just did it through their appropriations. Uh, Minnesota uh, increased their sales tax a fraction of a percent. Uh, Texas has a tax on sporting goods. And then Alabama has 10% interest earned from royalties of offshore natural gas. So there's a whole bunch of examples in this report I shared earlier that you can look across all the states and see how they're funding outdoor recreation. Uh, voter approved measures in the last 30 years there have been over 2,000 measures uh, collectively raising almost uh, $80 billion. So when, when Americans are asked, um, do you care about the outdoors? And would you be willing to tax yourself through let's say a general obligation bond with an increase in your property taxes? People overwhelmingly say yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a measure of how much people care about the outdoors that they're willing to pay for it. Um, here's another um, new approach. Uh, it's called impact investing. This is the Wayne National Forest. They want to create 88 miles of mountain bike trails. And uh, as you can see by the map, they're close to Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, P Pittsburgh, the driving distance from Washington, D.C. They want to attract mountain bikers and they want to get them to spend money. The way it's going to get funded, it's an $11 million total cost. 
They're, the city and the county is chipping in 2.5 million to get it off the ground. They're hoping that people will come and spend money and that will result in an increase in tax revenues. They're looking for impact investors. Now these are investors that could be foundations, they could be people who want a positive return on their uh, investment. And they're the first ones that'll take the risk if things go wrong, right? So let's say people don't come and don't spend money, these impact investors, they'll take the loss. So they're looking for impact investors who hope to eventually be paid back through an increase in taxes. So this is a new model. Let's all keep an eye on it and see how it works out. Um, a few years ago, we put together an online data visualization where you could track how the money was being spent for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, the first thing you should notice, and this is dated, right? This is 2011 to 2014. First thing you no notice is that these dots, that if you're on, online on this tool, when you scroll over these dots, there's a data pane that pops up and tells you how the money was spent in each one of these states. First of all, it benefits all states. And then you can see down below, it benefits states in a whole variety of different ways. Hunting and fishing, for example, and recreation and parks. Here's my story about this. Getting this data was so hard. It was impossible. We had a friend who had a friend who worked at Interior who said she might be able to get us a spreadsheet. And it took us a year of working with this friend of a friend, and that friend of a friend is now moved on, and we no longer have access to the data. This is one of our most popular programs in the country, and we don't track how it's used. Um, this is something we need to fix. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of examples. Um, there's Glacier National Park. As I said, huge amount of visitation, 41% increase since 2013. Um, but I want to point to the Whitefish Trail, because one of the things we can do is pull some of the traffic away from the parks. Let's say a family wants to go visit Glacier for five days. What if they visit Glacier for two days and spend the rest of the time in Whitefish? Because in Whitefish, we have a, a partnership there and they, they, um, the Whitefish Trail is, is an ambitious plan. What they want to do is a series of small clusters of trails around Whitefish Lake. Their goal is to connect them and go all the way around the lake. It's a hugely ambitious plan. Um, it's driven largely by volunteers and by a nonprofit organization. Um, they hired us to go in and put in trail counters and interview people and estimate um, what happens when people visit the trail? Well, it results in 68 additional jobs. The interesting statistic for me is that the locals who live there who use the Whitefish Trail spend twice as much money on gear as locals who don't use the trail. So for the Outdoor Industry Association, with all of their members, for them to invest in trails in local communities, it has a huge return on investment. People will spend twice as much on your gear if you invest. So if you're a mountain bike company and these guys approach you for money, you should say, yes, heck yeah, I'll support you because of huge return on investment. So that's their goal. Maybe offline we can talk about this. Um, measuring trail use is expensive. You've got to have trail counters. One of the promising new technologies is using Strava data, socially generated data, where people have GPS devices and they all load their information online. We've been able to get from the Strava company some data, and we were able to estimate additional trail use, not just in the Whitefish Trail, but in the entire three-county region, including the economic impact of that use, using socially generated data. So the Forest Service and BLM have trouble measuring use. Um, socially generated data is one way that we could figure out where people are going. Um, and finally, I want to leave you with Copper City Trails. Yellowstone is crowded. The surrounding national forests are getting crowded. But we've got some wonderful BLM land off in the distance where we can absorb some of the pressure. So this is a partnership that was done almost entirely, well, it was done entirely with volunteers. Um, it is a world-class destination mountain bike 
place that nobody knows about yet because it was just finished last year. It's every bit as good as Fruta, Colorado. Um, <clears throat> I'm an avid mountain biker. I went there with a bunch of friends, moving at a pretty good pace, and there's about four hours worth of really great riding. Um, volunteers, there's uh, the Park Service, there's Yellowstone, there's the Gallup National Forest, and uh, here's BLM land. And, and, you know, we can get all fancy with impact investing and plans and fundraising plans and trail design. This is Tim and his dog, Tom. Um, Tim, 10 years ago, approached the BLM in Butte and said, there's this amazing patch of BLM land that nobody's using. Um, there would be no conflicts. Can I build some mountain bike trails there? It took them two years to convince them. Um, they finally said yes. They have made it part of their travel management plan. And uh, so Tim would go out there with a shovel with some friends, and they'd dig, and they'd get about a few hundred yards, and they'd get tired, and they'd go out there the next day and do it again. And Tim's been doing this for years, and then finally it occurred to him, why don't we get the, uh, the local brewery involved? So he had a fundraiser at a brewery, and he'd raise $10,000, and he'd hire somebody with a machine. And then he'd run out of money, and he'd have another fundraiser at the brewery. Ten years of this. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, that's a picture of a parking lot. Um, we were so proud of this. We were, we were going, look, we've been discovered. Our parking lot is full. We can't wait to triple the size of our parking lot. Um, come visit us. We like to see congestion. And when you do, stop at Three Forks. Spend some money. Stay, stay overnight. Um, so that's... So I'm going to head to the, my conclusions here. The industry is huge. It's, it's absolutely massive. There's, there's no doubt about that. When you're bigger than the pharmaceutical industry, you're a big industry. Um, and it's not just about tourism, right? About, it's about our own quality of life. It's about attracting talented people to come live in our towns. Um, there's a huge pressure on the national parks. And, and quite frankly, the federal agencies cannot do this alone. So in terms of funding diversity, we've got the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Now we need to have it appropriated. We need funding for it. Um, there's lots of voter-approved measures. That's happening across the country. There's the potential promise of invest, uh, impact investing. But I think partnerships are going to be key. I think Americans care very deeply about the outdoors. They care about the condition of the trails where we recreate. And I think there's a huge amount of volunteer labor available that we can tap into. Um, so I'll leave you with a picture of what that looks like. Um, you know, you, 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 you get some barbecues and flip some burgers and have some beer and invite a bunch of people and they bring their tools and they spend a day and then you do this over and over and over. And within a few years, you've got a wonderful world-class place. So that's, that's me and Ollie. Um, this is, uh, I want to give a shout out to the Gallatin Valley Land Trust in Bozeman. They developed the Main Street to the Mountains trail system. You can uh, hop on your bike in Main Street, and uh, 25 miles later, you're on Forest Service land through a network of, of trails. Uh, this, again, took 10 years to develop, uh, largely volunteers, uh, largely local communities uh, contributing. So, thanks. a bunch of questions coming in, but again, if you have questions for Ray, please send them along or see Sam in the red shirt. Uh, so, Ray, we have a lot of questions, and they uh -oh. range broadly, so <laughs> uh, of the 7 million or 4.55 million jobs that were created, uh, did the studies determine how many of those jobs were living wage jobs, or, or more generally, what kind of jobs are we talking about? Oof, no, we, we weren't looking at that specifically, but it, but, but it goes all, all the way from construction to engineering to health care to people working in a shop to people who own the shop. So, um, you know, if for instance, if there's a Forest Service cabin, right, it requires lumber to build a Forest Service cabin. So part of the construction industry is part of the outdoor industry. Um, same thing with medical industry. Uh, People get hurt, 
I'm raising my own hand here, um, <laughs> you know, falling off our mountain bikes. And so that then leads to people going into emergency rooms. And so we measured all of that. So it's the entire economy. It's all sectors of the economy. If there's any association with outdoor industry, we have to give it a percent. Okay. Um, how much of the increase in visitation is due to recovery from the 2008 plus recession uh, with people just having more money to spend on recreation in general? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, everybody's wondering why recreation is going up so much. I, you know, there's the wave of retiring baby boomers with spare time on their hands, but there's also lots of millennials, there's lots of young people, there's more ways to go play outside, social media is playing a role. Um, you know, I, during the recession, I remember watching uh, hunting license actually go up. Hunting and fishing licenses actually went up. So some of the revenues for state fish and game agencies that are dependent on hunting and fishing licenses went up during the recession because people had more spare time. So I, I you know, it, it's a it's a very complicated question that I don't have the answer to. Okay. Yeah. I, the the map she showed of how the the land and water conservation funds are divided among the states were were fairly interesting. And the the question that got asked are Western public land states getting an insufficient cut of those funds? Uh, you'd have to go visit our online tool, and I <laughs> can tell you that I don't know that off the top of my head, actually. Okay. Um, the impact investing seems like a promising... Let me, uh, back to that last yeah. question. We don't just have the tool there. We also make the data available. So the data we have to bleed for to, to, to get is actually available for you for free. You can download it. And there's also sortable tables. So I think you could probably sort by state and add them up and, and get an answer to that question. Okay. Um, impact investing seems like a promising new model for project-based work. Is there any way for impact investing to address maintenance once a project is successfully implemented? Yeah, I think in the Wayne National Forest, they've, they've got that built into their budget. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's an important point. You, you, same thing with the, the last example I, I left you with of, of Copper City Trails. The, the maintenance is now taken over by a club and the club's raising the money to do the annual maintenance on the trail. So maintenance is, yeah, absolutely. you've got to build that in. Okay. Uh, in your last examples of dispersing use and coming up with new places for people to go, how does that dispersed use and increased trail development impact wildlife in these areas? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, Copper City Trails was picked specifically because of it's, it's a fairly barren place. <laughs> there's no water. Uh, there's not a lot of wildlife use. There's no elk herds there. There's no antelope. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think, you know, you've got to figure out not just where do people want to go recreate, but where should we recreate, right? And one of the things we're seeing on the Gallatin National Forest, because the agency has so little money um, to, I mean, in, in 30 years of, of going out into the National Forest, I've only seen once a Forest Service person out on the land. They just don't have enough staff. So as a result, we're getting user-defined trails all over the place. And uh, I think the ratio of user-defined trails to officially sanctioned trails is probably five to one. Wow. And um, when a bunch of people go out there with a chainsaw and, and they start building a, a trail, they, they not necessarily know what they're doing. Right? <laughs> and so you've got trails where they go straight down, that erode. You've got trails that are in places where there's a, a moose that frequents there with their calf. You probably shouldn't have a trail going through there. But it's all done in the absence of information. Um, without the agency involved telling us where people are allowed to build trails, uh, people are just going ahead and doing it anyway. Okay. Uh, back to the economic calculations you presented. Uh, do the economic calculations for recreation benefits take account of any of the economic costs that come with increased visitations uh, both on the public lands themselves and in gateway communities? And if not, yeah. do you have an estimate of what those corresponding costs might be? A, I don't know how you would do a national study of cost. Uh, the national study using GDP was complicated enough. Um, 
and that is with existing data. GDP is calculated based on um, you know the national GDP account. So we already know what's sold and traded in the U.S. economy, and each step of the way, as more value is added to it, we already know what those numbers are. And it took us two years with existing data trying to figure out how much of that was associated with outdoor recreation. Um, there's no data on costs. There's no national data set you could go to. I, I, it's a great question, but it's... <laughs> good luck. Good luck measuring <laughs> that, yeah. It, but, it's, but it's important, though. I get the point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another cost question, although from a slightly different answer or angle, uh, is anyone looking at the costs of recreation in terms of safety issues, rescue? You mentioned people having to go to the emergency rooms. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is, is there any way to segregate that out, or is it considered differently? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the um, efforts that's ongoing right now in Washington, D.C., is to, is to reform um, how counties are compensated for the tax-exempt status of federal lands. So programs like the Secure Rural Schools, PILP programs, to replace them with, with, uh, with an endowment, a natural resources endowment, that they, you would actually live off the interest of that rather than having to go to Congress every year to ask for money. Why is that important? Well, that pays for search and rescue, right? Those, those, when people visit uh, on public land, um, it's a cost to local government. And when people get hurt, uh, local search and rescue crews, they need the funding to come rescue you. And currently, um, there is, I, think, I think that's one of the biggest discrepancies is that the amount of recreation use on rural public lands, um, it's put counties in a difficult position. And so the reform of, of secure rural schools with an endowment program is, is I think we're close to getting that done and it's the right track. Okay. Thank you. Um, question on uh, funding different kinds of needs for the park. So uh, locally, some of our economic issues are just basic lack of operation and maintenance dollars to fund toilet cleaning, uh, trail maintenance, things like that. How do you get funding directed to those not quite as attractive aspects of funding uh, maintenance? Uh, as opposed to saying by uh, building the shiny new infrastructure or the new bi mountain biking trails. I didn't make this up. I'm just reading what's on the screen. <laughs> uh, you know, people need toilets. I don't, I'm not sure I understand. Ba basically, is the, the, is the, the, the accusation that toilets don't get funded and shiny new buildings do? It's easier to attract funding to shiny new things than basic maintenance, I Possibly. think is the question. I, yeah, no, I, I have no idea. I, don't, I haven't been in a fundraising position for the National Park Service, so I, I don't know. Don't know, all right. You'd have to ask a group like Yellowstone Forever that fundraises for Yellowstone. What percentage of the increased National Parks uh, visitation comes from foreign visitors? I don't know, but I know in, in Yellowstone, for example, a lot of it is buses. Um, buses with, with um, a lot of, we're getting a lot of Chinese tourists now, you know. And, uh, you know, one of the issues the Park Service is dealing with, too, is, is now dealing with a different user group. Um, you know, I just went to a Yellowstone Science Conference, and they, they interviewed Chinese tourists to see how their experience was, and yeah, you know, there were several things that were they thought were inadequate based on what they expected to see in a park. So, yeah, so you can cater to that demographic, and then what happens if it shifts, and then later on you get a different demographic. So it's that's difficult. Okay. Uh, are we contributing enough through taxations of goods on outdoor recreation equipment to fund the efforts you mentioned? Uh, and is all gear taxed, or is that very much a local issue? Well, you know, there was an effort years ago to try and accomplish something similar to what we have with hunting and fishing, where hunting and fishing is, is 
taxed. It, so there's a sale, sales tax on uh, ammunition and, and, and rifles, uh, for example, and that goes into a fund, right? And that fund uh, funds um, uh, wildlife habitat and hunting opportunities. So there was an effort years ago to try and get the outdoor industry to do the same thing. Um, I, this is a good question for, for somebody like Sally Jewell later on was <laughs> with REI at the time. Um, I know the what I've heard from people in the Outdoor Industry Association, if I can repeat their line, I'm not speaking on their behalf, but they said that their equipment is already taxed quite heavily. They pay an excise tax um, or an import tariff, I think, and so they feel it might tax some of their products to the point where they become unaffordable. That's their line. Um, on the other hand, end of the spectrum, you've got Texas, and they've been doing it for a while. Uh, they've been ta taxing outdoor gear. So, do you, do you know what the ta the Texas tax is? No, it's in our study, but you can okay. see how it worked. Yeah. Um, have you considered using the Freedom of Information Act to get the Land and Water Conservation Fund data? Did you try that route? We did. And in, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, okay, very difficult. It's a very popular program. <laughs> you would think it wouldn't be controversial. I don't think there's any um, malintent. I, I just think this is something that's very common within the agencies. We have also a tool on our website where you can look at the uh, amount of timber harvest that occurs on every national forest. And that's a tool that Forest Service economists use to get their own data. Um, because getting timber harvest levels on the national forest is very difficult to do. So obvious things that happen in agencies um, sit in somebody's computer in a cubicle in a basement somewhere, and unless you've got access to that one person, you're not going to get it. Okay. Um, a question on how new money might be distributed. Uh, very often it seems like new money goes to new people with the existing uh, residents and traditional users feeling left out and thus hostile to new outdoor recreational development. Um, have you seen this phenomenon and how is it best addressed? You know, I haven't seen any um, analysis on this. It's, it's an accusation I've been hearing for 30 years. Um, <laughs> The newcomers benefit, the, the old timers don't. Um, I just look at our main street and who owns the shops there. They've been there for a long time. And I see a lot of old time Bozeman businesses benefiting from outdoor recreation. So um, I, it, it's, a, it's a hypothesis that nobody's tested. And, and, and we end up answering it anecdotally, which isn't satisfactory either. But I, I just haven't seen any evidence uh, either to support that hypothesis or to refute it either way. No, I don't think anybody's looked at that. Okay. Um, and then I think what may be the last question, um, is there any justification for charging different user fees to different groups of people? Uh, for example, uh, well, there's already usually programs for senior citizens in a lot of places, uh, foreign visitors versus U.S. citizens, state visitors, versus in-state visitors versus out-of-state visitors. Um, have those kind of differential fee programs worked, uh, or are they just too random to, to do an analysis of? Well, we, you know, I think we do it by age, but we, you know, how are you going to discriminate by country of origin? Uh, how do you do that when somebody drives into a park? It gets really messy. I, I just read that, the questions. That gets really messy. <laughs> yeah. I do think what we're seeing is um, fees that are tied to the need for maintaining trails. And I think the off-road industry uh, folks have been pretty good at this. Uh, in Montana, for example, um, if you want to go in an off-roading area, you've got to have a license. You know, you've got a sticker on your vehicle. And if you want to, same thing if you want to ride a fat bike on a place that's been groomed for, for snowmobiling, let's say, you have to have a sticker on your vehicle. And so they've been pretty good at taxing themselves. And, you know, I could see other user groups taxing themselves too to generate a fund for maintenance. Um, I, I, I think it's a good idea.
Okay. Uh, and unless I'm missing something, I think I've, I've gone through the questions we have, and it's about time for our break anyway. So thank you. Thank, let us thank Ray again. And we will now have a half hour break, uh, so please be back here at 1045.